I just wish that I could like tell every single entrepreneur, like hire faster, outsource quicker. You hear people say that, but you're like, oh no, 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 I'll just keep holding on to this thing. But it's like, if you can hire someone to do it better than you, more quickly than you, and then you can focus on what you're actually good at, your business is gonna explode. You're listening to Oh Shit, I'm the Boss Now with your host, Jackie Koch, the podcast with all the tips and tools to help you succeed when all of a sudden you have the realization that you're the one in charge. Hey, welcome back to Oh Shit, I'm the Boss Now. I'm your host, Jackie, and today, super excited, I'm sitting down with a new friend who feels like an old friend to talk about what it's been like hiring friends into her business and when it works out and when it doesn't. And so help me welcome Keisha Get Mary to the show. Keisha is a multi-passionate entrepreneur, speaker, podcaster, real estate investor, and event host. Fun fact, what you're going to hear is she also used to be a recruiter for a long time. So we talk a lot about that, or I guess a little bit about that. And I just find we have so much in common in our past entrepreneurship. You got to check out her podcast, Empower Her. It's one of the top rated personal growth podcasts with almost 8 million downloads and an engaged community of women who connect with Keisha's high vibe energy, transparency, and come with me, let's figure it out together approach to life and business. She's obsessed with in-person connection and curates events and spaces for women to get in the room through her large annual event, Empower Her Live. Empower Her meetups across the country and intimate Empower Her retreats quarterly. I can't wait to go to the live event. I'm really hoping I can make it happen in September in Denver and we talk about that. So today, like I said, we dig into um, all things hiring friends and, and when it's the right thing to do and when it might not and signs it might be working and signs it might not. So thank you for tuning in and can't wait for you to get a sense of her energy. Keisha, welcome to the show. This is only our second time ever talking in sort of real life, um, which is wild because we have so many like mutual connections. I can't believe this is only the second time. Um, I so know. thank you. It's so wild. I'm so excited to be here. I just love what you're doing. I love your energy. I feel like we're going to have a super juicy conversation. Thank you for having me, Jackie. Of course. Of course. So we have a mutual friend, Lori. Um, and I just, I have to tell you this. I don't think I told you this when I saw you the other day for probably a year and a half, she's like, you have to meet her. Like we need to all hang out with them, you and your husband. I'm like, we would all be like best friends. And so I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I should set the record, go on record as saying Lori was right. Um, so. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> um, so before I just start, you know, asking a bunch of questions, can you give listeners a little intro to who you are, how you became an entrepreneur and and all of that? Yeah. So I did what a lot of listeners will probably connect with where I did the thing that I thought that I was supposed to do. And then when I got there, I looked around and was like, crap, this is not what I want. And for me, uh, my background was I worked as an IT project manager and then in engineering recruiting. And it made sense on paper. And because we become a byproduct of the expectations of our peer group, you know, all of my friends at the time and my then boyfriend now husband, like they were like, Keisha, this is just like what we do. Like you count on the days till Friday and it's just kind of the thing. And I wasn't in a bad situation. I actually had really good managers. I had really good career trajectory. I made a really great income, especially in comparison to kind of that stage of life for a lot of my friends. So I felt like there was something wrong with me that I wanted more and that I felt like I was out of alignment. So I kept like shoving down this feeling that was telling me that I wanted something that was more aligned for me, just like shoving it down, pretending like I didn't care. But you know, like when you shove something down for too long, it's like, it just pops up in like the weirdest yes. ways. It's like whack a mole. You're like, shove it down, shove it down. So eventually um, that led me back in 2014. It led me into starting a network marketing business on the side of my full-time corporate job. That was kind of my gateway drug into entrepreneurship. And it gave me another stream of fulfillment, helped me figure out a lot about myself. That then turned into a really large business. Then I got that uncomfortable gut feeling again, about four and a half years in. Um, I had supported my husband, Cena through dental school. We moved to San Diego. 
And I was like, I want to do something else, but I didn't know what that was. So I started a podcast called Empower Her. And my intention was to build a come with me, let's figure out life together type of podcast that was at the end of 2018. And from that, I decided if I cultivated community, and then I asked my community what problems they had that I could solve, then I could develop another business. And then I could get away from that business that I was building previously that no longer felt aligned and jump into my own thing. It turned into podcast courses, programs, events, merch, speaking, all sorts of cool stuff that I get to do now. But it's been a lot of like ups and downs, you know, because you know, being an entrepreneur, it's like totally. you your best day and your worst day in the same hour. And then you ugly cry on your bathroom floor where your snot and your mascara gets together and you choke on it in your mouth. And it's just like a shit show sometimes, but it's so freaking fulfilling and I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> okay. Do you know what? We have even more similarities than than we realized. So I have been in recruiting in HR my whole career, but my first stint into entrepreneurship was in network marketing as well. And it fueled that, like, I think I could do my own thing, you know? And um, so that's so crazy, like very similar in that way. I just happened to still like the recruiting aspect and the team building side and found my, I found my next entrepreneur journey, like in this, which has been really fun. Can I say one thing yeah. that I just thought of? I know this is your show, but I feel like if we were in person talking about this, I would be thinking this, that like, there are some people listening in right now that they think they have to change career paths completely to feel excited and aligned. But you're a perfect example of this where like you liked recruiting in HR, you just wanted to change the container in which you did it, where now you're an entrepreneur building your own business, but you still get to use some of those skills, right? Which I think sometimes like I have women that will come to me like, I don't want to be a teacher anymore. I'm like, well, maybe you just don't want to teach kindergarten. You want to teach junior high, or you don't want to teach in that school district, or you don't want to teach in the classroom, but you still want to teach and create courses or something. So sometimes it's like, like, I just love that you're an example of that, Jackie, because people need to see someone do it that way too. You know what I mean? Totally. Totally. I think, you know, when I first went into entrepreneurship, I actually have a podcast coming out about this, but I was like, I got to do something I love and that like I'm passionate about. So it was wellness because yes, I want people to be healthy. And then I was like, I don't want to do this for a job. This is a hobby, you know? Um, but I think what I found was I like running a business. And so I, I love this. I think teaching people how to do this is so critical. Is it my ultimate passion? No, but like, sorry, listeners, but you know, I'm, I'm multi-passionate. I love a lot of things, but I love running a business. And so that's what I learned. Like, I like that aspect. So it's been super fun. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to dive in with you, and I think it'll be really interesting because you've done recruiting before, um, is how and what it, or I guess what it's been like working with some of your best friends, because you are an example of bringing in friends to work for you and with you. Um, and you've, you've, you've seen it work, you've seen it not work. And I want to dive into that because I think a lot of entrepreneurs, it's either they hire their family or their friends and it doesn't work out. And there's a lot of reasons why it doesn't, but I want to talk about how it can. So let's first dive into your first like who was the first person you brought in to work in your business and how did that go? Yeah. So I had the mentality that I think a lot of entrepreneurs have where it's like, I don't want to spend any money hiring anyone because I feel like it's going to be more beneficial for me to just do it until I was hanging on by a thread and I literally couldn't handle it. And I recognized if I get myself burned out, the business is dead, especially in my type of business where I am still like, you know, the face of the business. Right. And until, uh, until I realized like, it was really important for me to find someone that had the skills that I didn't so that I could really take it to the next level. I tried to do it alone. That was, I just wish that I could like tell every single entrepreneur, like hire faster, outsource quicker. You hear people say that, but you're like, oh no, 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 I'll just keep holding on to this thing. But it's like, if you can hire someone to do it better than you, more quickly than you, and then you can focus on what you're actually good at, your business is going to explode. Because although this first person that I want to share I hired didn't end up working out long term, spoiler alert, it did really help me at the beginning because I learned the importance of having someone that has the skill set that I don't. I'm a big visionary and I have lots of ideas and I can go a million miles like per hour creating and staying in my lane, being in my zone of genius, but I'm really bad at details. I am not organized. Like I'd like, I mean, I got on this podcast interview because like I have someone who checks all my calendar now. So I'm not scrambling all over the place, right? Like I'm, it's just not my wheelhouse. And I used to 
beat myself up about not being good at those things until I was like, nope, screw that. I'm just going to double down on my strengths. So I hired someone that I was friends with and I knew that she was in a place where she didn't like her job that she was in and she had some time on her hands. And I thought, well, she seems like she's a little more detail oriented than me. And it's funny because I have a recruiting background. I should have like really vetted if this was going to be a perfect fit. But I felt like she understood kind of that previous business of network marketing because she was part of it. And I felt like maybe she could grow with me. But there is this really interesting element that I didn't think about, which is how lean our team is. Because basically, I just hire a lot of contractors that work with me. And we can talk about that in much as much detail as you want to. But I, um, I needed someone who has like an entrepreneurial mindset that can understand that hours are not going to be structured. Like sometimes things have to get done at weird times, especially in that startup phase. And she, while she had some of the detail organization skills and she's a really great person, she wasn't happy with how unstable it was because it was so new. She couldn't roll with the punches. That wasn't one of her skill sets. And now she works at a company, she works at Amazon and she loves it because she gets time, you know, she's, she's on from this time to this time. And when she's off, she doesn't have to worry about work. And I think I, I thought because the vision was so fun and that we were friends that I could just kind of morph this. And eventually she would kind of build the skills that she needed to go where I wanted to go and and that we could really complement each other. But this, I just didn't vet her adaptability enough. She had some of the core skills, but she didn't have the personality that she was going to like it. And when you have a lean team, you have to have someone that's also really excited about your vision. And I just don't think that she was, if I'm really honest, you know? Yeah, for sure. As you're hiring and recruiting, you know, you do have to figure out, you know, how much structure does somebody actually need versus what they say they need? (laughs) Because anybody is going to, And anyone who's genuinely excited at first is going to be like, yeah, sure, I can do that. Yeah, I don't mind. But, you know, trying to vet them out for like, but the reality is, is I'm going to text you on Friday at 430 and like need something like, is that going to become a problem or, you know, and you probably, I would imagine early on, you didn't even know to like use that as an example or I don't, no. I don't know. Oh, I had no idea. And there is this element that I'm sure you've talked with so many people about too, where like we were close and I knew her financial situation, which isn't a bad thing, but I took more responsibility of her financial situation of wanting to pay her more because I felt responsible for it rather than paying her fair market value for what she was doing in the amount of hours that she was working. I got into this really slippery slope of paying her more than the hours and then getting frustrated that she wasn't putting the hours in, but I actually didn't have the hours for her, but I knew that if she was going to be part of this, she couldn't have a full-time traditional job. So it's like, I just didn't know what I was doing, honestly. And I look back and I learned a ton from it. And I, I didn't make the decision that hiring a friend was a bad idea. I made the decision that hiring someone and hoping that they'll catch on to the vision and that hoping that they'll end up liking the lifestyle that being in this entrepreneurial, like small team type of mode is, and that was wrong. Right. And, and, and that's okay, but it was definitely, I mean, it was a shit show. (laughs) Well, and you're also figuring out, I mean, to your credit, you were figuring out what your business was, what you needed, like all of it as you went. And I would, have I have to imagine if you're listening to the show, the majority of you who've made your first hires, it wasn't the right hire. Me, even me, myself, you know, I hired somebody initially last year because I needed help. I was like, I just need help. And I was like, I think I just need like what I thought I needed was recruiting help, which I did. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'm going to hire this person and I'm going to train her to be a recruiter, but I'm going to have her do some like online business manager stuff right away. Um, and it was through hiring her that I realized I didn't actually need that help. What I needed was to your point, an outsourced social media team, an outsourced podcast manager, And then I just needed to find a sourcer. I needed somebody to find me people to talk to. I didn't actually need a recruiter, um, but it wasn't, it was through hiring the wrong person that I realized what I actually needed. And so I usually don't talk about that, but sometimes that's what you have to do is you have to hire the wrong role. It wasn't the wrong person. It was the wrong role. Yeah, the wrong role for sure. Like now hiring her, if I had a different type of role, like maybe it could work. But even back then it was... It was an interesting 
problem because I was close to her and I was invested in her finances and wanting to support her and and feeling so grateful because she was my first hire and like kind of grasping onto the vision of what I thought it could be and having a little bit of just ignorance of being new. And then what happened was I, she was interested in event planning and we were going to have our first event back in 2020. Um, Obviously I didn't know then, but this was the time when we ended up phasing her out because I was like, a huge part of your role was going to be events. And we're not like, what is going on in the world? We're not even going to be doing events right now in 2020. And I felt so much guilt around it that I decided I'm just not going to hire anyone. So I, after we phased her out, you know, we gave her like a really good severance and I did what I thought was right. Probably more, I mean, definitely more than most people would have done because of that situation. But then I was like, I can't hire anyone because I don't know how to hire. So I'm just going to do it all myself again. And as you were a recruiter forever, you don't know how to hire. That's just so funny to me. Okay. Isn't that funny (laughs) where I was like, well, I clearly like I get too close to people. So like, I don't know who I I don't know what my business is going to turn into. I don't know what I'm going to need. Maybe I just won't hire anyone. And then I went back to like, I'll just hustle my face off. And then what happened was my community and my podcast, my programs and everything were growing at this exponential rate. And I was just, I mean, I was doing the ugly cry thing because it was, it was a great problem that was growing so fast, but it was still a problem. I literally couldn't handle it. And I'm like, I'm about to throw in the towel on all of this. And I care way too much about this vision. So I was telling my best friend, ironically named Jackie, uh, my best friend of 15 years, who also had a recruiting background, ironically. um, And I was telling her, I'm like, I can't handle this. She's like, let me just help you on the side until you figure it out. Let me just stop the bleeding. And I can help you with some things because we know I've got the skill set for this. And then it ended up turning into that's actually who I have full time hiring hired now. That's awesome. Yeah. So has anything shifted in like how you communicate and like, say what you need? And like, I guess I, I, I'm interested in unpacking how you can still have a work relationship and a friend relationship, how you separate them, how you don't, how you, how you say when things aren't going well. I mean, I, this isn't a question, but I'm sure I'll have questions. Just super curious. Yeah. So one of the things that you mentioned earlier of like, it's not just about like what, how they think they want to work, but it's also like what they actually need. Right. So for example, Jackie, you know, we've been best friends for so long. I know her personality so well, she is very roll with the punches and she can get stuff done ad hoc, but she loves structure and I'm a little bit of a squirrely person. So I was like, I need to make sure that I'm communicating and giving her like a game plan each day, even though it's not what I would normally do. And it's not how I would want to be managed. But I don't want to be in the corporate world. And I don't want to have a boss. We're different people, right? Like I would feel limited and like closed off if someone was telling me this is what you need to get done every single day. I'd feel like I was like shoved into a box. But for her, it helps her understand what she needs to get done. And she feels productive and excited and like she's contributing and she's adding to the vision. So for example, every single morning, Monday through Friday, I'm sending her a list of like these, this is the main focus for today. And this is what my schedule is for the day, including all my personal stuff. So she knows kind of like when I'm available and I do it every morning. It takes me about 15 minutes, but it's become part of my morning routine because our team is so lean that I can delegate like what are the main priorities for her to focus on. And I know about how much bandwidth that will take on a given day. So I had to implement that structure where it's really like boss employee relationship via email. Right. And then we have these containers where, for example, every single Monday for many years, we've done a call together. And when we're working, now that we're working together, it's like half of the time is like our bestie catch up chat. Like what happened to this weekend? How are you feeling about your life? And then it's almost like we just both switch to other gears. Okay, now let's move into business. And then I become the boss and she becomes the employee and we're co-creating together. And it's just like, we have to actually acknowledge it. Like, okay, now we're done with our bestie chat. Now we're moving into this relationship. And it sounds really funny to say it out loud like that, but we have to create the differentiator between those two conversations because you know, she knows that I know what's like, she's about to get married in a couple of weeks. And I know she's got a lot of appointments and things going on. It's like, I want to know what's going on in her world as a friend. But regardless, these things need to get done. So it helps us kind of like touch base on knowing when are these things going to get done during that day or that week. So I don't have to micromanage, but I understand what she's focused on, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and understanding that and also like kudos to you for 
for doing something for her that doesn't necessarily come natural, like sitting down and making the list. You're probably like at first, God, I don't want to have to change my behavior to do this, you know? And I think so many bosses just accept, like expect their employees to change to th- their that like how they are, you know, I, I think about like the remote work versus in office work. Like so many CEOs are like, we are better in the office and they're unwilling to change how they are when it's like, sometimes that's what you have to do, right? Change who you are. Um, was that hard to build that habit of, of sending that to her every day or no? Yeah, I think it was, it, it was, that was one small thing. But the other thing I had to realize too is how to separate. So I am a very squirrely excited person. And when she's focused on something, she needs to get in the zone on that thing. And I would be the distraction. Like we, she lives in Seattle and I live in Denver. So like if something exciting happens, I immediately want to FaceTime her and tell her what's going on, but she's in the middle of doing something. So I, as the boss, I guess, am actually the problem for her productivity. So I had to learn how to like separate that out. Like, Hey, I know you're wrapping this up. Send me a text when you're done. And let's chat about something when you get 15 minutes or like, let me know when the best time is for you. So I'm actually catering a little bit more to her schedule rather than me. My natural tendency as a friend is to tell her things that I'm really excited about, but it's really disruptive. And while it works for me with my ADHD and like how squirrely I am, that's my brain pattern, but I don't want to feel frustrated that she's not getting stuff done that needs to get done when I want to point the finger at her and be like, you weren't productive. It's like, no, 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 Keisha, you point that finger back at yourself. You were the problem. She was trying to get this shit done, but you were like squirreling her all over the place. So I think like as a boss and especially as someone who is an entrepreneur with a lean team, it's like, I also am really aware of what my strengths are and what type of environment that I want to have, like my day-to-day life. So as we bring in contractors, for example, I'm like your main like point of communication is going to be Jackie. When we're doing meetings, I'll be on it. So I'm like very, very clear about expectations when we're bringing people in of like, I don't want people reporting directly to me. I love them talking to her. So it's almost like I've kind of set those level set those expectations. And I know that that's something that she enjoys. And it's honestly something that she's much better at than me. So I'm like, you focus on that. And I can go build relationships over here, which will drive into the business or whatever is more my skill set. But it also is just like knowing what you're not good at and not making that mean something. Like, I don't feel like I'm not successful because I'm not super organized. I'm successful because I know how to hire someone who has the skills that I don't now um, through trial and error, right? Yep, totally. I want to dig even more into the feelings (laughs) that come up, right? Because um, when you're working with employees in general, there's going to be times when you, something is going to be said in a way or a decision is made in a way that makes someone not feel good. And you're like, I can tell they're upset. How do I bring it up? And then when it's your friend or a family, you're like, fuck, how, now this is even harder. Um, have you guys had any of those times and, and how do you, how, how have you handled those? Yeah. I have made it a priority to gain a lot of self-awareness as to how I act when I'm stressed, because what's interesting is I don't appear as stressed often because I'm, a, I reframe things really well to be positive and optimistic. That's a superpower, but it's also a double-edged sword because if I'm stressed, I become a little bit more direct, but it's not how a lot of people come off as stressed, like a little bit more frantic. I don't come off that way. It's more like this needs to get done. So what's been interesting is I've, I've learned a lot. Like I love Enneagram as a tool. So I've learned a lot about myself and like where I go to when I'm stressed and how that gets, um, like, put out into the world, like how I express myself when I'm under stress. And then I've learned what she does as well too. And I think like that as a tool to understand how do we act and how are we motivated as individuals? Cause it's extremely different. And what is like her, she's an Enneagram nine, which for anyone that's familiar with that, that's the peacekeeper. They love like group harmony. She wants to make sure everything's okay, which also means that sometimes she doesn't want to say her opinion if she doesn't feel as if it is going to be in line with like what the group thinks about something, right? She wants to make sure everyone feels comfortable versus me. I'm a little bit more selfish and I say what I want and I'm really unapologetic about it, but I have to be aware of like the fact that she wants to make sure everyone's cool with this decision. So it's almost like 
getting to know people and whether obviously it's easier when you have a lean team. And I care about getting to know her on a really deep level because we're best friends and have been for 15 plus years. But even with like a smaller team of employees, like when we hired our website contractor, I wanted to know what her Enneagram type was. And I wanted to know what it is like, what's her work style and how does she like to be communicated with before I told her what my like expectations were, it was almost like, what does she prefer? Because so often when you're hiring someone, they're going to say that they can cater to your needs, but you know, if they're, if that doesn't feel aligned for them, I want to know what lights you up and how do you work? And let me see if that's a good fit for my style. And am I willing to give a little bit too? So we can both feel really excited because as someone who's also an extrovert, I'm really energetic naturally, but I'm also really impacted by my environment around me. So I need to be around people that are excited in whatever their version is. So I've kind of taken that on as being part of my responsibility when I'm hiring is like figure out what they need to light themselves up and be passionate about what they're working on. And that's also why I like working with contractors too, honestly, is because like they're subject matter experts in that area. I bring them in, they do their thing, they're pumped about it. And then I don't have to worry about it long term, you know? Well, you're, you're hiring for expertise too, right? Like as a small business, well, small, whatever, I'm yeah, call small you business, small, yeah. even though revenue would probably say you're not small, but um, like when you are a small team, what you often need is like generalists, right? If you, if you're going to hire a bunch of people into your business, you need generalists, uh, well, actually, no, I would argue at first you need specialists, but you don't have full-time work for specialists. So outsourcing projects to people who are experts, you might pay a little bit more, but you're going to get what you actually want. Like you don't want to be involved in the decision-making or, or what that is. You just want to be like, this is what I need. Deliver it to me. Right. And then as your business grows, then you need generalists who like can do a little bit of everything in marketing to get some stuff done. And then as you get really big, you need specialists again. Um, and sometimes you don't ever need a team of full-time employees because you just need experts and you can pay for the best experts. And that's often contractors. Um, I talk about that a lot on the podcast because I think everyone thinks their first hire needs to be an assistant. And I'm like, Ooh, I actually think you need contractors. <laughs> yeah. First. Well, I, I love that you said that too, Jackie, because so often people tell themselves the story that in order to grow a business that has high like profit every month, even that they have to have this massive team. And we have really high profit months for our team size. And I actually like it this way where it's like, you know, as we'll grow, we'll continue to need to add people into the mix. But I love the way that you described that of like a generalist where Jackie is like, you know, she's kind of like a jack of all trades to a certain degree with her specialized skill set, just the way her personality is and her natural things that she likes to do. But it's when you have someone like that, it's important for me to be having her enrolled in the vision of where we're headed and have her excited about the big picture vision. But I don't need a contractor to be excited about where the empower her brand is going in two years, because I'm like, I just need to make sure you can make this website. And our interactions together are great. And you do a really good job. And then moving forward, it's like, if we end up needing to hire someone who can do all of that stuff, then we can get them more enrolled in the big vision. Because that does really matter to me as the, you know, I guess the founder of this or whatever, that I have people that I'm working close with that are excited about where we're headed, but it doesn't put so much pressure on them to have the perfect skill set and be enrolled in the big vision if they're a contractor. So I do think that that can be really helpful. And I did for one point, like, I remember I actually made when I was like, I'm going to build a company. Like this was actually only a couple years ago, right before I went into Chris's um, elite level mastermind, I was making, you know, a good amount of income. And it was just me and Jackie was like part time at that point. And I was like, I need to build a massive team. So I made this hypothetical org chart, which I think could be really helpful for people when they want to grow. But I was like, I need to hire someone here and here and here. And I had this whole org chart. And I was like, no, I don't. You're to your point, Jackie. I need a generalist and then I need some contractors. That's all I need at this point. And I don't need to worry about a future version of me's problems of like, how am I going to hire this person? It's not relevant yet. Keyword yet, but it's not relevant to me. So it's okay if I don't have that game plan yet, you know? Totally. Like think year long stints, right? Like yes. people want to hire for the next five years. I'm like, you don't even know what your business is going to be in five years. Like hire for the next year for sure. So you talk about hiring contractors. Everyone always asks me, where do I find people? How do I find them? 
how do you find them? Like, how, where do you get, where do you go? How do you find if you know you need somebody to support your business? How do you find contractors? 100% referrals for me. I just ask my community. So I prioritize getting in the room, connecting with people, having conversations, people's podcasts that I've been on or what, you know, anyone that I feel has potentially an opportunity to connect me with someone that could have the right skill set. I would personally rather work with someone that's been vetted by someone that knows how to vet someone or has worked with them and they've delivered a good you know, outcome or result for them. And so I always just go to anyone in my community, hey, I'm looking for someone that has this skill set. And if I can't find it within my ecosystem of friends or other entrepreneurs, or for someone listening into this podcast, if you don't yet have a community of other entrepreneurs, number one, it's your responsibility to get yourself in the room so you can meet those people and connect because it's so much more fun and fulfilling to build a business when you have other people that you can be like, today I had my best day, my worst day, my same hour, you know, like I'm freaking out and like just have people that you can connect with. But then I also have found that there are people in my community when I reach out via like social media, I'm looking for this type of a person to bring on to do this, or I'm looking for a brand, or I'm looking for someone to speak in this particular, you know, that has this skill set. I love getting referrals from my own community and I love co-creating with my community. And obviously this is really specific to my type of business where it's very community focused, but I think there's a lot of power to build that connective tissue with your audience when they feel like they're kind of part of decisions or getting to share their feedback. Even if you end up going a different route, people getting to contribute and like put their voice into it, it makes them feel really valuable and it just makes it feel more integrated so they can get enrolled in the vision of where you're headed and be excited about that too. Totally. I think you just said a couple of things I want to highlight for listeners. You know, definitely leveraging your community on social, wherever it is, but that can't be the only thing. Like you can't just post one fucking story saying, hey, I need a graphic designer and then cry when you get no responses. Like <laughs> that doesn't always work, even if you have a big audience like you, right? And so do you do direct asks? Like, will you, if you're like, okay, I need this, I don't know, niche role. Will you be like, who do, who have I met recently that I've loved X, Y, Z, and then like send them a specific note and ask them for oh, a yeah. referral? For sh- <gasps> you do? Just kidding. <laughs> I mean, I think that's really helpful of like, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Does anyone know someone that has this exact skill set um, and reaching out directly? But honestly, if I was in a situation where I'm needing like, needing to hire someone like what you do, Jackie is really important because the other part that's really helpful is to have people that are vetted by the time they get to you. Because the downside of like hiring from your own community is like, I remember we were hiring someone that was going to do like some social stuff for us. And we got a bunch of candidates, but they are people that have gone through my podcast programs or had been through my event, like, you know, been to my event. And I felt this weird sort of like, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. So it's almost like you sometimes need to get someone that's like, not as connected as you are from an emotional standing and get them to vet the people and then bring those people to you and just like creating that barrier between you and the candidate first so that you take a little bit of your emotions out and you get the best quality candidate and it feels more fair for the candidate applicant process and all of that rather than me just being like, oh, I like this girl. I think she could be great. I'm like, sometimes I just don't even trust my own judgment because of, you know, prior hires, but you know, I think, I think it's like using your resources, whatever resources you have available, like look at all the tools that you have in your toolbox and be like, do I know someone like, can I hire someone to help me? And it's worth it. Like, like you and I have talked about this, but it's like getting good people to work with you to co-create and build your dream. Like this is such an important decision. Like you are spending so much time with them and they become, you know, an extension of you into your community, to your clients, to your customers. Like it matters hiring the right people and it can expedite your growth like freaking crazy and make it more fun, you know? Totally, totally. Okay, I'm side, I'm going back a little bit to if, um, earlier in our combo as we're starting to kind of wrap up, but I'm, I'm sure there's listeners who are like, okay, great. I have some ideas for, or they might find themselves where they've hired a friend or a family member and they're like, Ooh, it's not the right fit. What would be some tips you would give them for knowing that it's not the right fit and how, how to go about handling the situation? Because I'm sure there's people listening who are like, okay, what she just described is, is, you know, the, the first scenario is where I'm at and I want to, you know, 
get out of it or, or know if I'm in that position. So what advice would you give them? Yeah. So I think it's more about playing it out a year from now, because sometimes in the moment it's like, we'll just keep them. It's okay. And you kind of downplay it because it feels like it's going to be awkward to have a tough conversation, but truly the person that's working for you, like if they are a friend or a family member, they also are probably going to intuitively know that it's not working. They're going to feel that from you naturally. So it's almost like playing it out. If they could be in a much better situation for them a year from now, and you could have someone who's really excited and is the right skill set working with you a year from now, it's going to be so worth it to have this tough conversation. So tap into the you one year from now and think about them, right? So when I, my first hire that I had to let go, it was, it, it sucked. Honestly, I, I, like cry, I, I did not do it in the right way. Like I was really emotional about it, but I did play out to her. Like, I think you're going to be, I know it sucks right now. And I'm so sorry that this didn't work out the way that we planned, but what we need now for the company is just different. And I, there's a lot of things that I are unknown. I don't want to keep you feeling like a lot of this is unknown or make you feel as if you don't have the right skill set for this job, simply because I, for me, I didn't know what the right skill set was for that job because I didn't understand what the company needed at that point. But when I explained to her, I was like, I can see a vision in the future for you where you work in a, in a place where like you're off when you're off. And I was able to kind of explain to her where I saw it going from my perspective. It didn't make the conversation less awkward or less difficult, but I felt really good about it. And I think she could understand that I cared about her because I was picturing her in a better environment that was actually more conducive and supportive towards the life that she actually wanted to have. So some people say don't make it personal. And I think there's a certain line of like not making it too personal. But I do think it goes a long way because it's still a person. And like, especially when it's a friend or a family member, you care about the relationship. And it's like coming from the lens of I care about you. And I want you to be in a job where you're thriving. And this is why this isn't working. It's not you, but it's just the skill set and making it more about the skill set or the stage of life or the growth of the company or the direction and, and being really transparent. That's always worked for me. Transparency is, it's awkward, uh, but it feels better because people know that you care, you know? Yep. Totally. I feel like people forget when they go to work that you can just have, be a real human and like have the hard conversations and it's, it, you're right. Like, leveling with them and just having the real hard conversation always, always is better. And it's, it usually is always less awkward when you're having it than the two weeks of stories you've built up to how it's going to go. Like in the moment, it's usually a lot easier than you, like <laughs> the awkwardness you put into thinking about doing it. It's, and also it's like, all of this time and energy that you waste hypothesizing of how the outcome could be or what the conversation could be like. And you get so stressed and overwhelmed and you can't focus on anything else because you're just building this up in your head, like creating this story. And then you have the conversation and often it goes better than you think that it's going to go. And they like, then you get to walk away and you both go your different directions and you're like, oh my gosh, I have brain space again. I can think about something else besides this conversation that I've been building up in my head. It's like rip the bandaid and do it faster, right? Like that, that's another tip I would give is like, when you know that it's not a good fit, just do it faster because you're robbing yourself of a lot of like, just joy. And then honestly, even brain space, because you're going to think about this for so freaking long, but also they feel it from you. They know if it's not working and like, don't, don't do that to them, you know? Right. Like if you're a little bit unhappy, so are they, and that's not helping anybody. And that goes for, if it's a friend, if it's not a friend, like that, just know that like, you're not alone in that. Um, but they may not be willing or able to like bring up the conversation. So it's your job as a boss to be the one to go first. Yeah. Yeah. And even like, I, I remember like when I had someone that I had let go, I was like, I will give you the most glowing recommendation for your next job. Like, I think you're great. It just wasn't a good fit. And it's like, I felt like because I even wanted to go above and beyond that it was received better because of that. Cause it's like, you're a great person and you're a great employee, just not for this role. It's not, it's not as personal as we sometimes like to make it, you know? And it depends if they were a really bad employee, don't say that. <laughs> That's true. Don't put your <laughs> reputation at risk by saying that, then don't offer that. But if they were a great employee and it wasn't the right fit, <laughs> that's a different story. <laughs> exactly. Oh, awesome. Well, 
I feel like we could talk so much more and thank you so much for coming on the show. I want to pick your brain about being a boss more and more as you continue to grow. Um, think how can tell listeners where they can learn more about what you're up to, how they can join your communities, come to your events. I'm sure they're like, Oh my God, I want to be around this girl's energy. So how can they do that? <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. So my favorite platform is podcasting. Cause obviously if you're listening to a podcast like this, you probably like other podcasts too. Mm-hmm. Mine's called empower her. It's a personal growth podcast. It's Monday, Thursday episodes, and it's a really like, come with me. Let's figure out life together. And there's a little bit of business in it, but it's really like in the personal growth lane. So come check that out. And then my favorite social media platforms are Instagram for sure. So Keisha get Mary on Instagram or empower her podcast. We have empower her retreats, live events, all that stuff. I talk about it on the show and on social media too. So thank you so much, Jackie. I appreciate you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. When is your next event? It's September 22nd through the 24th. You need to come in Denver. It's going to be epic. We did our first big one in Phoenix uh, last October. It was for 500 women. And this year we're like, let's double it and just like blow this shit up. So it's going to be awesome. We actually might be driving home from Minnesota to Arizona and going through Denver around that time. So I mean, that feels perfectly aligned. You, you gotta come. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. Well, thanks again so much for gifting us your time. And I can't wait to keep talking with you more, even offline. Yes. Thank you so much, Jackie. Awesome. Thanks listeners. We'll chat with you soon. you're over there wondering, oh shit, I don't know where to start with building a team or how to hire. I've got you covered. I created a course specifically so you can learn everything I've learned and continue to invest time in improving about setting up your hiring machine. You can enroll and start today at hiringschool.com. P.S. This is the process leading startups are using to scale their teams and we're teaching it to you.